Welcome, everybody. I'm Michelle Hardy, CEO of Meeting Sites Pro. We're a full service worldwide meeting and event management company. And we are here uh, to talk today about how we can leverage uh, social media to brand ourselves. Um, in this environment, it's more important than ever. And I'm really excited to have you guys here. And many of you have been on these shows for the last few months. I thank you guys for being repeat. Uh, for showing your loyalty coming back to these shows. Uh, it shows, I really appreciate that because it shows that I'm giving you content that's good. And the goal of these and the meaning of these meetings is really to help. They were brought about to help our industry. I'm still doing it to help our industry. It's to inspire, elevate, educate, and to keep us all moving forward. We wanna focus on what is possible rather than what is not possible. And so that being said, we're gonna go ahead and introduce our panel today. We have uh, Mariah Benz, she's the podcast host for The Marketing Mindset. Thank you for being here, Mariah. We have Deborah Boggs, co-founder of DNS Professional Coaching. Thank you for being here today as well. And we have my friend and colleague for over 30 years now, Valerie Sparks. She's consultant for hospitality social selling, and she used to work on the hotel side. That's how we originally came in contact with each, with each other. So she's got a very unique background, specifically in hospitality and now in in, um, in social selling. And I'm going to kick off with Deborah um, on the show. And I'm just going to ask Deborah, can you tell us why LinkedIn is important for professional branding? I think you're, um, this is going to be the classic comment. You're muted. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So getting off to a good start. Uh, yeah, you know, LinkedIn um, specifically is really important for a few reasons, especially if you haven't used it or you haven't really kept up with the network, but you know, it's really, really growing. They just reached over 7 million total members. Um, and 95% of recruiters use LinkedIn to identify candidates now, especially in the US. So it's a really, really important way to be found, especially if you're in the middle of a job hunt. Um, you can also use the platform for job hunting. There's millions of jobs listed um, as of last week. I think there were 4 million jobs in the U.S., many of which are remote. So that's definitely, you know, a growing opportunity as well, which we'll talk about a little bit more when we get into keywords. Um, and complete profiles uh, show up in more searches. So make sure as we talk more about um, optimizing your profile that you're really taking advantage of that. And the reason your LinkedIn profile is important is really because when buyers or employers reach, uh, you know, pull up your LinkedIn profile, they're either going to gain confidence in you or they won't. And so we want to make sure we're really putting our best foot forward. I love that. I know there's, I know you have some key tips for um, how to elevate your LinkedIn profile. Can you cover that? Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to talk about some of the just top ways to kind of make a quick impact on your LinkedIn profile. And we'll get into a lot deeper information in a little while. But these top things are some of the most um, visible uh, real estate, if you will, on your LinkedIn profile. And the number one is headlines. You know, headlines show up um, anytime someone's looking at your profile or you come up in a search or you comment on a post or anything like that. And so a headline is a really great opportunity to brand quickly who you are and what you do so that anyone who sees, you know, not only your profile, but, but just sees you come up in a comment or whatever knows what you do. And so, you know, it it automatically defaults to your company name and title, um, but you can really use this to customize and you know ways to think about that are to do industry plus job title plus your area of expertise um, or job title plus the value to your audience. You know these are just kind of um, uh, templates or or um, you know kind of uh, formulas, if you will, to get you started on thoughts for um, a headline. Just, uh, I, love, I love that you put examples here, Deborah, underneath it. So those of you that I really like that she's giving you guys examples. So I would take advantage of looking at these examples as, as ways to really make yourself stand out because I do think they're invaluable. Thank you, Michelle. And, uh, and a quick note about size. Um, so recently, LinkedIn extended the headline size um, option to 220 characters. I will say that is a little bit long and clunky because it, sh it cuts off in mobile. So I found the sweet spot for keyword optimization as well is about 160 characters. Um, the headline is the most heavily weighted section in your profile for keyword optimization and, um, you know, and, and uh, uh, search engine optimization. So if you want to kind of pack some SEO into your headline, make sure you put in keywords that you'd like to be found for. And, you know, whether you add them as a list or kind of build them into a value statement, either way, that'll really help you show up in the searches you want to show up in. And I know another thing that I, I get a lot of is looking at the background photos. Uh, 
and the and also your photo. I know we're going to cover that. That's probably a bigger pet peeve of mine. But some people don't even have those background photos at all. There's nothing there. Yes, and the background photo is such a great opportunity to add additional branding to your um, profile. It shows up immediately on mobile and desktop, um, and so it's really a great way, you know, to either, um, you know, brand a company like this gentleman in the top right did, or top left rather. Um, this woman in the top right uh, is um, corporate communications director for her company, and so she's showing off the fun atmosphere of the company she works in. Um, you know, if you are a little overwhelmed about the thought of putting your company out there or if you're currently unemployed, things like that, you can even just another color like this woman in the bottom right, another color, texture, things like that are a great way to set your profile apart without, um, you know, without having to, you know, make something custom. If you do want to make something custom, I love Canva to make custom backgrounds for free. It's great. It's easy to use. Um, or unsplash.com to get um, free background images just to pop in. Yeah, that's a great feedback on that. I've seen some people too that have had, um, do you guys hear some feedback? Is there some on my end? Okay, I've, I've had um, some people that have uh, been open for network for the jobs because there's so many people looking for jobs right now and to mm -hmm. change the background to say open to network even in the background piece there or maybe tell a little bit of a story about you. It's prime real estate right there. And I just think util utilizing that is fantastic. Yep. So um, let's talk a little bit about the photos because I really am challenged when I get photos and they're black or they're looking down or people are sideways. I mean, right. it's just, I don't know what they're thinking. Huh. Yes, if I could, um, if I could like get a billboard and put it up anywhere so that I could tell people <laughs> one thing, it would be take a LinkedIn photo with intention. Um, and the reason is, you know, for a lot of us, especially in this world where we're all remote or we're all, you know, in a lot of parts of the country quarantines and things like that, our, our LinkedIn photo is oftentimes our only opportunity to make a first impression. And so we want to think about what we want that first impression to say about us. How would you walk into an interview? How would you walk into a potential client's office? That is what you want to look like in your LinkedIn profile. So, you know, the dress, the, you know, the facial expression, things like that all really need to match that. And some of the best practices um, through studies they've done on what performs best on the platform are um, collarbone and up. So, you know, closely crop to your face. And that's so people can make a human connection with you. And looking at the camera, again, about that human connection and then smiling, you know, being approachable, looking uh, like you're somebody, someone would want to talk to. So those are what really performs best on the platform. And you can do it at home, just do it with intention. Absolutely. And I, real quick to go back, you had mentioned something to do with a um, with Canva, another program other than Canva that they can use for the background pictures. What was that called? Yes, that's unsplash.com. Okay, unsplash.com. And then also somebody was mentioning on the headlines that they had heard that it should be written in first person. Do you have any advice on that? Yeah, great question. I like first person, but take the pronouns out, kind of like a, like a resume would be. So, um, you know, delivering you know, high quality sales, blah, 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 whatever it is, but, um, but not saying like, I do this, because that's a little bit forward, but third person is a little bit awkward. And that brings up a good point. Best practice all throughout LinkedIn is first person. Perfect. And then one more thing is there's something called, uh, as far as the photos go here, we're looking at this photo profile. There's a, 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 a URL called photofeeler.com. It's P-H-O-T-O-F-E-E-L-E-R.com. And that offers, really gives you free photos and they look really professional. It'll help set you up. So if uh, there's nothing else, you guys, that big tip, make sure you go there to make your, your um, profile pictures look like these and not this next set. Yes. And uh, real quick about photo feeler. I love it too, because if you get a few photos and you can't decide what you like best, you're, uh, you're allowed to put up a couple photos and have um, strangers on the internet rate you on competence. Um, uh, you know, uh, so they have them for professional sites too. You know, they, they either have them for dating or professional sites, but competence, approachability, things like that. And honestly, the picture I have is not the photo I would have chosen, but it was overwhelmingly the favorite on the internet. So I think that's helpful too. Fantastic. Thanks for those. So these, here's some examples of how not to do it. And I think most of these are fairly self-explanatory, but Deborah, talk to me about the one on the bottom left. Yeah, so um, so these are some things that I see all the time on LinkedIn, and these are all real LinkedIn profile photos. But the bottom left, the, the problem with this one is this, this woman is highly competent, has a very high level job, and, and 
in person, she was dressed completely appropriately. But us as, you know, for you ladies in the audience, we need to think about if you can't see where our top ends, um, it kind of looks like she's wearing a blazer with nothing underneath. And that's not helpful. Same thing with, you know, tops that are maybe um, sleeveless, uh, things like that, you know, where we may look topless. That happens a lot more often than you'd think. And we just need to be aware of that, especially when our network could be, you know, all over the U.S. and international and things like that. We need to be aware of how we're coming across. Perfect. Thanks for that. I know there's a question that's saying, um, could you provide the photo link in the Q&A? So I just put it in, you guys, photofeeler.com. It's in there. Um, so I'm done with Great. that one. Okay. So I'm going to ask just, are there any other common mistakes that people should consider for photos or backgrounds or anything that we haven't discussed yet? Yeah, the common mistakes, two of them, and they're kind of um, brought it well, a couple things. You know, lighting is a really big part of, you know, taking your photo with intention, making sure you've got good lighting. This gentleman on the top uh, right looks, you know, super excited, looks competent, dressed well, but you can't see him, and that totally takes away from what he's got going on. And then I have no idea why people take photos of themselves in the car, but it makes me insane. If you have a photo where you're in the car, please take a photo with intention. I, I don't know where the trend came from. I saw a gentleman the other day, and I, I wish I could have refound it because I wanted to add it to this. But uh, you know, he was dressed well, great lighting, looked good, had a tie, a suit, button jacket, and a giant seatbelt. Like it was, it just took away from the whole thing he was going for. So please go outside, have a friend take your picture. You know, I actually I spoke to one, one woman the other day who said um, she went to a, she was in a wedding, and so she knew she was getting her hair and makeup done. She just took a change of clothes and had the photographer take her picture while she was there um, for her. <laughs> so if you want to go extra, you could do that too. Thank you so much. I appreciate the tips on this, Deborah. And I know you're going to stay on. We're going to have you back in just a little bit. I'm going to welcome now Valerie Sparks. Mm -hmm. And Valerie, welcome. I want you to talk a little bit about business development. I, I know it's what I've been asked probably the most about, and people are very sensitive about doing business development at this time frame. And I, even you and I, when I brought it up to you that I wanted you to discuss it, had some conversation around, you know, what the intent was of discussing, discussing this. Can you share some of your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's, it's really important that we think of LinkedIn as something, as a sales professional, we actually can't do our jobs without. And, and I just, I'm just going to use a couple examples. One would be when you receive an RFP. And so when that request for a proposal comes in, obviously you have an immediate point of contact. Well, you know, now that there are many of them are electronic requests for proposal and not necessarily an immediate phone call where you can build some rapport on the phone, you literally just have a piece of paper in front of you with a name, a title, and some specs of what that planner might be looking for. Well, now you have this incredible tool, um, LinkedIn. And so you should immediately with, I mean, every single time, this just needs to be kind of common practice. You're going to pull up this person that you're about to engage with. And um, the very first thing that you want to look at, one of the most powerful things that, that, that you can find out about this person is who are your shared connections. And what I mean by that is which connections does, does he or she have that you also have? What connections do you share? But if you haven't done the initial work on that, then this tool isn't going to help you, right? So if you don't have any connections, guess what? You don't have any shared connections. So you want to first and foremost, you know, if you have to, if you have to mark it on your calendar as a to-do, you need to connect with your comp, with your, with your comp set. So who, who are your competing venues? Connect with those sales professionals, connect with your vendors, Connect with your vendors, connect with your competition, connect with all of your lead sources, whether you get leads from uh, Meeting Sites Pro, whether you get leads from other third party meeting planners, um, CVBs, DMOs, any place where you get leads in, you need to be first connected with those people and your competition. Why? Well, if you get a lead and you know, if, if you get an RFP or a lead, and you pull up the planner and she's connected to three of your competitors plus your, your CVB rep if you're a hotelier, whoa. <laughs> so this tells me that this person um, is out there and engaging, possibly sending other, other leads. Um, you might, if it's, if, it's, if, if, um, 
if it's a really like hot lead and it's something that's qualified and you have the availability after you um, send the information that the client needs, you might be able to pick up the phone and contact one of those um, shared connections to learn more about um, more, more about that, that planner. Also really easy, low hanging fruit, connect with all of your team members, right? So if you work for a company like Marriott, just connect with as many Marriott salespeople as you possibly can. If you're a part of destination hotels, connect with all of your destination hotels people. Because if, again, you pull up the planner and then all of a sudden one of your global sales managers connected to her, wow, you know, that's, a, that's, that's something that I could really leverage in this new relationship with this planner. I love that. And I, I know when I was first starting off, I didn't accept uh, everybody that was sending me network things. I was pretty picky about like, do I really know them? But I, that has changed over time. We have connections in common and you never know some of the best connections I've made. I mean, uh, Mariah and Deborah are both from uh, connections from that and Christine Iverson for that matter. So it's, it's about having kind of, you know, wanting to build your network and connect with people that um, may be able to be a resource and collaborate with you. Can you talk a little bit more, Valerie, about how to use LinkedIn to target prospects? Because in your my day when we were doing sales, we were out knocking on doors, dialing for dollars um, to get business and LinkedIn was not uh, dominant then. And, and this is such a great resource. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to say one more thing on the viewing a profile when a lead is received. Yep. Um, we, we all have our standard qualifying questions, right? Tell me what's worked well in the past, right? What, what has made this meeting successful before, right? Because we use that intel to sell into it. Well, what if that person just started their job, right? What if they've only been into it for six months? Or what if they've been doing it for 15 years, right? They're, they're probably savvier at your job than you are because they've been dealing with people like you for a long time. So I really think that it's important that we look to see how long the person that you're about to engage business in has been doing um, his or her role. Perfect. Okay, okay, now let's get on to what I really like, the good, the good- Targeting. Team. Targeting prospects. Oh, so fun, right? I know. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's just, and then, um, you know, I can remember working for Marriott Hotels, sitting in a, in, a, in a conference room with four other salespeople. We all had a phone and we were all given a sheet of names and numbers and we dial for dollars and that's it. We didn't know if the contact was still there. We didn't know anything about it. You just dial for dollars and you just hope for the best, right? Yeah not the case anymore. You know, we don't, yes, we should be dialing for dollars, but using social media intelligence to make that much more targeted and more fun and save time. So let's talk about um, using LinkedIn to search for new process, for new prospects. So your first step is number one. And please note everybody, do not use your mobile app for this. Everything that I'm about to show you on um, searching for for new prospects within LinkedIn is using the desktop version. Um, also, everything that I'm going to show you right now is with a basic non-paid membership. So nothing that I'm showing you is, oh, it's because I have a paid profile and that's why I can do the things. Everything that I've screenshot moving forward is with a basic profile and it's using the desktop version. So step one, from your homepage at the very top right, there's a magnifying glass. You're gonna click on it. Okay, step two, you're going to get to that people, jobs, events, connections, locations, and you can click on all filters. So it's a, it might be, it's hidden on my screen right now, but to the right of current companies is all filters. You're going to want to click on all filters. That's going to take you to this step three, which is kind of a lot more juice, right? Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about to pay or not to pay for LinkedIn, but just note with this basic account, I can only search for my, my first and second connections on this right now, right? So, so it's saying like first and second. So guess what? It is so critical to have a ton, a ton of second degree connections. I cannot tell you how critical it is. And one of the easiest ways to do that, I find, is I took like my, you know, my Rolodex, like my, my folder of business cards, and I would just go like page by page, put them on LinkedIn, connect with them. You know, that's another 
that's another way to like really start beefing up your second degree connections because every all let, let's say I connect with Michelle today and Michelle has 4,000 LinkedIn connections. Guess what? 12,000. Oh, excuse me. So everybody, <laughs> today, you just gained 12,000 second degree connections. Holy schmoly. That's pretty flipping <laughs> awesome when it comes to people searching on LinkedIn. Okay. So now connections of, I don't care about, I'm, I'm on this step three now where I'm filtering location. So I can put in, okay, I, my, um, my sales territory is the greater San Diego area, or I typically get most of my leads from San Diego. So in that add a country region, I'm going to put in S A N D let it find greater San Diego area, click on it. Um, current companies can be tricky. Uh, they have to have a company page. Not everybody has a company page. Um, let's see, is there another, is the next slide titles? Yes, thank you. Okay, this is, so this is all one page. Okay, so what you just saw and what this is, is all of the all filter screenshot from a basic desktop LinkedIn account. Um, just getting into some more juice here. Um, I can go into industry. So um, Michelle was talking about market segmentation and that's if, if you have a certain um, industry that you target. Do you have a certain geographical region that you target? Let's say I'm going to target tech, right? Because, um, you know, of all the industries right now, healthcare and tech are hiring, right? So I used to go on Indeed and look to see what, what organizations are hiring. And then I would target those industries for meetings. If they're hiring, they typically have money, they're typically doing meetings, right? Um, so you can, you can go here and you can filter an industry schools we don't care about you know for the most part for what for what for what we're doing we don't now look quick, at the bottom Valerie, right real quick yeah, somebody ahead, is saying when they click on search they only see their history their own history okay let's go back to i think i think but let's go, go back, back, go back to, to the slide. previous slide the yeah let's slide. go yes this one so step one step one at the very top of your LinkedIn page, there is a magnifying glass. You need to click on that magnifying glass. And then um, just, just for kicks and giggles, you could click people next, and then you could click all filters. And then that will take you right there to all people filters, which will be the screenshot there. And then if you go to the next slide, you're also gonna see this other meet. Now check out this title page, I'm sorry, this title box. Bottom right, oh my gosh, talk about the beauty of that, right? If you typically are going after executive assistance, human resources, you know, whatever keywords you typically find, you mean that I can, I can go in LinkedIn and it will tell me who in San Diego, um, uh, which executive assistants, right, in San Diego, in tech, I can, I can do that filter. Yes, you can. And this is, and so this is a screenshot of what it's going to give you. But guess what? If you just created LinkedIn today and you go to do this, you ain't seeing nobody. Okay. So the first step is you've got to grow. You've got to grow your network, like, you know, connecting with Michelle. Feel free if you're a, if you're a hotelier and you're going after meeting professionals. Um, feel free to connect with me today too, because then all of my my meeting professionals just became your 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 second degree connections. Um, but I really wanted to show that this is some powerful, um, very targeted um, searching within LinkedIn. I love this, and I use this I, I I use this all the time to search for contacts. And another a tool you guys can use is something called the Book of Lists. Uh, San Diego Business Journal, local business journal have a book of list that they put out. And so it's the top companies in, in, in different industries. It'll even give you some names of the people that are at the company. And you can go and connect with them. And then once you get one of them as a connection, then you can connect with other people from that company. And then you can really go in here and target your uh, sales efforts, your business development uh, efforts in a specific area. So I just, this, this is a game changer. Saved so much time from the old days when we did not have this as an option. I used something when it was first coming out called Hoover. Do you guys remember Hoover.com? Okay. I think it's still around, but, but that was the, that was like the coolest resource that I could find that was as close to being able to do stuff like this. And this is a million times better. So those of you that are out there, you know, you ha you're in a great time to be doing business development with this tool.
And, and, and if, if you think about how targeted that second degree search is, the, your first search results, if you're connected to all of your competitors and all of your vendors and all of your colleagues, um, you know, think about like the power of connecting with like a CDB, for example, it's going to show you who within their network with that title, it's, it's going to show you their, you know, it's, it's going to show you their people first, right? So it's extremely targeted. Well, I, I know there's a couple people, uh, Rafaela and Marianne, um, I can't go back and, and continually just focus on this uh, piece of it um, for the two of you. But I do want to let you know, if you stay on towards the end of the call, I'll personally stay on to walk you through what uh, Valerie uh, was just uh, talking about, just to make sure that you guys are able to find that area. And remember, if you don't have any connections in your network, I don't think that's the case for either one of you, but if you don't have connections, the stuff won't show up. So just, uh, just be aware of that piece of it. So let's talk about the LinkedIn company page um, for research. Can you tell me why that's important in the yeah, sales process? Good. Yeah, so continuing, this is, this, is, um, this is going into business, um, more of the continuing on the business development piece. So I want to show you, I'm going to show you two examples of um, what to do with the LinkedIn company page. And again, this is from the desktop version. I want to show you um, how, to, how to research a LinkedIn company page, why it's, um, I want to show you how to, how to research a LinkedIn company page, um, why, it's, why it's important. And, and I want to show you a difference between um, a, a large company like Oracle, and then I'm going to show you a, um, a, small, a smaller company as well. So you can kind of see the, the, the differences between um, researching a LinkedIn company page, whether it's a large company or a smaller company. So here is, here is, um, here is Oracle, right? Couldn't be much larger of a company. They have um, 5 million followers on LinkedIn. And if you can see, it says they have 184,000 employees, which isn't 100% accurate. It means there are 184,000 LinkedIn profiles attached to this LinkedIn company page, right? So let, let's go ahead and let's, let's pretend like I just clicked on 184,000 and we'll move on to the next, the next slide. And then we can see what that would look like. Okay, hold on just one second. So I think for this right now, when she clicks on the next slide, you'll see that there's, there's the first and second contact. So you can actually narrow down the search even further on this by clicking if they're a first contact or a second contact, and then you can apply it and you can dig, even dig in deeper. So your first contacts are contacts you already have established uh, relationships with via LinkedIn. And the second ones are ones you may want to try to look into establishing relationships with. And then yes. it also has a location area. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so if I click on the 184,000 connections, look what's checked first, the first and the second, right? Because as we talked about, LinkedIn only wants to, they don't wanna show me 18,000 profiles. They don't wanna make it so easy for me to be like, oh, 18,000, I'm gonna start filtering those 18,000 by executive assistant or those 18,000 by San Diego. Slow your roll, you're not paying for anything, right? I don't wanna show you that. But if, you, if you're not paying for anything, it will at least show you your first and second degree connections. Also note where it says current companies in 64. The reason it's doing that is there are 64 subsidiaries of Oracle. So it's showing me the 18,000 people of the entire um, company of Oracle along with all of its, um, so, along with its, all, of, all of its subsidiaries. I can also start filtering by location, but again, it's going to show me my first and second degree connections first. But if I'm working for the Hyatt um, Mission Bay San Diego, and I'm connected to the entire San Diego CVB, and I go click on Oracle, guess what? It's going to show me who else the San Diego CVB within Oracle is connected to. Whoa, you know, that's kind of cool, right? So let's go ahead and um, now that you see, I went to a, I went to a large, LinkedIn company page. I clicked on the number of profiles. This is what it shows me. Let's go ahead and um, click into a, another example. So this is a smaller company, right? Thankfully, Michelle doesn't have 18,000 employees. I don't think she's quite ready for that. So yeah. this, is a, 
<laughs> this is a great example of, um, there are a lot of smaller companies out there and any organization can have a LinkedIn page. Remember, company is deceiving. Uh, hoteliers are getting a ton of business. For, there's a committee, a society, an association for everything. And the majority of them pretty much are getting more savvy with LinkedIn because it's free for them to create a LinkedIn company page. So those, asso those associations, those societies, um, those organizations can also have LinkedIn company page. So it really should be like LinkedIn organization page research, but we won't, we won't get into semantics of that. I just wanted to kind of have you understand that this is fantastic for association. Um, you know, if you're like, if I'm working for the Mission Valley Marriott, they do a ton of association business. This is fantastic for searching for um, associations. Okay, so now I, my, remember my first step is I search for the LinkedIn company page. I'm not searching for people. I'm searching for company page. I put in Meeting Sites Pro and clicking on the Meeting Sites Pro company page. My next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on the 16 profiles attached to the page. And this is what I see, right? Now what's interesting, just so you know, Michelle and I are connected and she'll be down a little bit there. It's not necessarily in exact order. You know, it won't show like Michelle first. She will, it will show me my first and second degree connections, but it won't necessarily be like, oh, Michelle first. And then these other, you know, and, and then these other profiles within, um, within Meeting Sites Pro. But I, I do think it's really important um, when you are targeting um, certain companies, like before you kind of think, well, you know, how am I going to, okay, so this is a hot company. Like um, the, I used to do this training all the time with hotels. They would um, pay for a reader board service, right? Who down, uh, which competing hotel down the street had meetings last week? And literally there is a company that's, you know, telling, um, they're, they, they are telling all the, all the comp set, who's meeting where. So that's fantastic business development juice right there, right? But the first thing that I would do is I would pull up that organization on LinkedIn, click on the number of employees, see, see kind of what's going on, what do I share? You know, just kind of gain a little bit of intelligence, social intelligence before I start um, really thinking about how am I gonna strategically go after this um, organization to find out who planned that meeting down the street. So let's talk a little bit now about how to use LinkedIn to stay on top of your network. Okay, yeah, I already, um, I got into the- I covered some of that. Yeah, I just, it, because I can't tell you how important it is. So I kind of yeah. did already talk about that, but let's, let's really kind of dig into a little bit about how um, ineffective a business card is, right? So if you only have business cards and you haven't turned them into LinkedIn connections, when that person changes jobs, that email, is obsolete, right? The phone's obsolete, um, but most people now are kind of keeping their LinkedIn profile pretty current. And I do not see LinkedIn going anywhere. You know, Microsoft took it over how many years ago? Um, you know, Bill Gates owns everything. He now owns LinkedIn. <laughs> I, uh, I don't see LinkedIn going anywhere. So I really think it's, it's worth the investment. As soon as you get that business card, right? Um, well, We'll, we'll go into a little bit about the etiquette about when to request to connect, but especially already collected business cards, turning them into, um, into, into connections. And you can't talk to a Rolodex of business cards, right? You can't say, hey, let me share this article with you, or let me tell you what's going on with my property. But if you, if you post something on your LinkedIn homepage, it can appear on the news, the news feed of your first degree connections, right? So it's such a great way to, um, to stay top of mind. Another great way of staying top of mind for your, um, especially if you're finding that you have some, some downtime for whatever reason, calendar it. Okay, today I am going to write three LinkedIn recommendations for my LinkedIn contacts. And it's just kind of like a nice way of saying, hey, you know, I've really enjoyed working with you. Um, you can do this with your vendors. You can do this with your colleagues. You can do this with your client. I don't know anybody that doesn't like a LinkedIn recommendation written about them. So that's a, that's a great way to stay top of mind for repeat business because, I mean, we all know that we can refer we can refer leads to each other too, right? So if you go and you write your competitor, who should be your friend, uh, especially in hospitality, if you, if you write your competitor a, um, 
a uh, link, uh, you know, if you write your competitive recommendation on LinkedIn, you're just staying top of mind. So maybe if she can't take that lead, maybe she's like, oh, you know, you got to call Joe, Joe, uh, you got to call Joe down the street because you're staying top of mind by, by, by providing value. I do need to, especially in a climate like this, I want to talk about staying um, apolitical while we're staying top of mind for repeat business. Exactly. So I haven't been in the industry in a, in a few years, but you can't, you can't take my heart out of hospitality. So I really enjoy going onto my LinkedIn, seeing what the industry is talking about, learning about industry trends. I'm extremely passionate about it. I love um, seeing my LinkedIn connections and what they're doing on LinkedIn. What I'm concerned with is there are way too many hospitality leaders that I know their political affiliation. And I shouldn't. I shouldn't know who they're going to be voting for. We've got to keep politics. And I will tell you, it's not that they're they're not posting, you know, um, they're not posting articles, they're not creating posts, but guess what they're doing? They are liking things. And LinkedIn is so desperate for engagement that if you even touch your computer, your connections are going to know about it. And it's not even that they know about it, it's the very first thing they see when they logged in. When, when I log into LinkedIn, the very first thing it shows me is anything that my first degree connections liked or commented. And I'm seeing my first degree connections like and comment on politically related topics. And I don't think that they're doing it on purpose. They're not trying to be a political, they just don't realize how crazy LinkedIn is about putting any sort of inch of engagement in the faces of first degree connections. And now even more so, it actually stays on your profile, even if I'm not connected to you. If I go on your profile at the top, it talks about activity. Anything you've liked, posted, commented on is directly on your profile. So be really thinking about that. You know, I understand we're all very passionate about a lot of things. Just ask yourself, as I do this, do I want all of my connections to know that I'm doing this because it will be blasted. Um, it will be blasted to them. Another thing I have noticed, and I think it's, um, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's really a trend in the hospitality industry. We don't know what an authentic voice looks like or sounds like on LinkedIn. We don't mean to come across salesy because I know these people. They, when they do a site visit, they're so authentic. You know, they're genuine, they're caring, um, they're so warm. For some reason, when they get to the computer on LinkedIn, they can come across as a little bit salesy. You know, call me today, you know, uh, book me for your next meeting, you know, all that kind of stuff. Just keep it out. You know, if you, if you think you're sounding salesy, you probably are. Right, so there's no need to directly come across as salesy on LinkedIn, you know, providing that value, industry trends, what's going on in your hotel. Um, if you see it, a really interesting article about productivity, um, there's also a lot of free meetings publications out there that are providing really good content. You can share content that Michelle is posting. She's posting some great engagement. You can, you can um, share that right to your network. So you're providing value. Michelle's going out of her way to not come across as salesy, but providing value. So you can take some of that and you could share it. She would like that. And I think that your, your, um, your, your first degree connections would, would as well. Just, I really Valerie, want to, oh yeah, just real quick on that. So I do want to talk about it because a lot of people don't know the difference between salesy and, and the authentic piece. I've had a lot of people say, well, how do you come across authentic? And it is different in person than it is over social media. So I just really want to tell you guys what she's saying here, this is so important, is you don't want to post things that, that could potentially be divisive. Nobody's, nobody can hear the tone or anything that you're, you're putting out there. So you just want to be careful about what you put on there. And I don't think LinkedIn would be a place to do that anyway, although I do think some people have been crossing some lines with social for it. But I would keep that in your Facebook space or your Instagram space if it's not oriented towards business. So just keep that in mind while we're going through this. Can you talk a little bit, Valerie, about just for the sake of time, we're already at um, almost 11. Okay. To, yeah. to pay or to not pay? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, the free versus the non-free versions. Yeah, so what I want everyone to understand is how do you get to the screen of where you view the upgrades? 
And so um, from your home page on your desktop version, you're going to go to the top right and you'll see there try premium. Okay, if you're not already paying, you'll click on that. And that's going to take you to this next screen right here. And it's actually going to, this is actually two screens together. The left screen is what you're going to see first and you click explore all plans. That's going to take you to this next page, which is are the four options. And for here, for I think for the most part, people here are going to be either interested in the business or the sales. And let's go ahead and dive into the business first. So if I were to click on that business column, it would take me to premium business features, 15 in-mail messages. I do not see value in sending in-mail. I do not think that LinkedIn is quite, I think in other industries, I noticed my husband works for a large software company. I think they are using in-mailing more. I do not think that the meetings and hospitality and events industry are using in mails, as far as I don't think that they're thinking of their LinkedIn inbox as their second inbox. So I do not see the value in paying for the in mail messages. Unlimited people browsing, it will allow you to see a lot more of your th uh, of up to third degree connections. So if you are, um, so let me put it this way if you, if your business development typically comes from small companies, you know, under, 25, 50 people, and you don't actually think that they have LinkedIn company pages. You don't know how much, if they really have LinkedIn profiles, you're not doing like enterprise sales, which is like big companies, like, like MGM is doing a lot of enterprise sales. If you're a smaller pr property, you're focusing more on smaller meetings, maybe more like um, so uh, societies and committees and associations. That um, added feature of being able to view more of your third degree connections for business development might not be helpful for you. But if you are going after bigger companies and you're doing enterprise sales, there is, and you are in business development and you need to be because your lead generation isn't great, there is an incredible amount of value in that unlimited um, people browsing online, video courses, you know, whatever. Um, who's viewed your your profile. As of now, you can see the, the last five people that viewed your profile if you're not anonymous and you're not paying for it. If you pay for this feature, the business premium, you will be able to see who's viewed your profile of those that have not made their profile anonymous. Um, business trends, don't think that's relevant here. Career insights, I also don't think that's relevant here, but take a look. It's not cheap. It's $47.99 a month if you pay for the annual subscription ahead, right? And so that would mean it's at least $50 a month if you are not doing that. So if that's, that is not cheap, but I hope that kind of uh, showed you a little bit of the value behind it. The next okay. one you can click on that would be the sales and it would take you to this. Um, and so the, the sales navigator is only for salespeople that are going after big companies. Okay, so if you are an enterprise sales professional, you wanna do Sales Navigator. If you're not going after big companies, you don't need Sales Navigator, don't even, don't even worry about it. LinkedIn Sales Navigator was truly created for tech companies. Their sales teams are all using it. They're all getting huge ROI on it. That's really what it was designed for. It's extremely expensive, okay? But if you're, a, if you're a larger company, like this might be a conversation to maybe have on like the global sales office team for Marriott, for example, maybe, uh, maybe MGM, you know, for their, for their global sales team, maybe some of the bigger properties, maybe some convention center sales. Sure, that could be a conversation where this may be a value if people are really going to use it because it's, you know, it's, it requires some tech savvy. And it's at least $65 a month. That's if you are um, being billed annually. So extremely expensive. And so I Valerie, have just, just real quick, just because mm -hmm. um, I, I want to try to wrap up and they, I have some questions for you. You okay. can actually get a subscription of this for free for 30 days. And in most instances, I know I've signed up for a couple of them. So if you are thinking about it, try the free prescription or subscription before you actually do it. Somebody's asking, if you, how does a like impact your ranking? So if you're liking thing, does it, what exactly does what, how does it impact? And then the second part of the question is, what exactly does a view mean on items that you post, share, or like? Do you? Okay, so I think, the, I think the question is, what if I like something on my LinkedIn newsfeed? Is that, is that the question? Yeah, how does that impact 
your ranking. So if I'm liking and contributing more, how does that affect my ranking? Okay, I would not worry. There's no value for what we're talking about here out of ranking. And that might be something where if I'm a small business owner and I have a blog and I'm really trying to like use that blog to get more leads, but when it comes to meeting hospitality event sales, don't be concerned about your ranking or anything like that. That's just not, that's just not where we are. It's not something to even sort of like think about, but as far as what happens to that, like now all of your first degree connections, will see that, that post the next time that, that, that they log into their LinkedIn. Okay, perfect. And then the other thing is what about the views? What does a view mean versus a, a like or share? Like that, you know, it shows them the number of people who viewed your stuff yeah, versus so a like or share. You, um, yeah, so if you, if you post something on your LinkedIn news feed, such as like an industry article, for example, or maybe some, um, some information or photos about something, um, some upgrades that are going on with your property, it will show you on the left side how many people are viewing that. And then as that gets liked, so as your first degree connections like that, guess what? Those second degree connections have now seen that in their feed, right? Because we just talked about how um, how if a, someone likes your stuff now, all their their connections, it's it's in their it's in their feed as well. So I really like that quantifiable information that's right there on the left, showing you how much exposure what you're sharing on your news feed is getting. And then the other question is, um, interested to hear your thoughts on LinkedIn Stories, what they should be used for. Is that is is that a new feature? I'm not familiar yeah. with LinkedIn Stories. I have. I think. I haven't, haven't used it. It's okay because it's Kristen Olson that's answering that, and I, I I feel like Deborah will have an answer for you, Kristen, directly on that. So we'll just hold I, off on that one now. But just so you know, I haven't seen any of my connections um, use it, and I haven't seen any of them like anything on it, whatever that means. I don't okay. Know. Perfect. Valerie, thank you for being on. I know you're going to have to jump off the call um, eventually, so um, thank you for being on and stay on as long as you can. If you can stay on till the end, that'd be great because we'll have some more Q&A for you. I have a special break right now from Christine Iverson that is going to be coming up and she is going to do the opposite of a meditation. She's going to kind of do take over, do a break to invigorate us and uh, just make us feel more focused and more alive. So welcome to the show, Christine. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, so I dropped in the chat the Pomodoro technique. You may or may not be familiar with it. Um, what the Pomodoro technique stresses is after every 25 minutes, you want to take a short little break. There's even a time clock for Pomodoro. So what I'm gonna do, we're gonna do four quick exercises. I'm gonna run through this very, very quickly, and I'm going to invite you all up out of your seats. You may have heard sitting is the new smoking. So up out of your seats, wonderful. So these first exercises simply begin lifting your heels, standing on your toes. We're gonna do this for 20 seconds. All right, so up on your heels. So these quick little exercises you can do while you're on a webinar, like we are right now. You can do them when you're on a phone call. No one even has to know that this is what you're doing. All right, next quick exercise. Put one foot in front of the other, one foot behind, and begin to pick up your knee. All right, this, as you pull up and lift your knee up, you're actually increasing your heart rate right here. So do one more on this side and switch over to the other side, one foot forward, one foot back. And this is a quick technique that you can do, again, taking a break throughout the day. Now the last physical technique I'm gonna go over, we're gonna squat down and hip opener. Squat down and hip opener. So again, you can do this, remember if you can, to get up out of your chair and out of your seat, and you can choose any of these techniques to do. Now, next technique is called the Wayne Cook exercise. We're gonna do the standing version. Wayne Cook is known for stuttering and stammering and a lot of his work in this area. Take your left foot, cross your left foot 
over your right foot. Take your hands out. Left hand over right. Fingers cross and pull your arms in. Take a deep breath in with me and exhale through the mouth. One more breath, deep inhale and exhale. Excellent, release. Release your hands, release your legs. Right foot crosses over left, right hand over left. Clasp the fingers and inhale. So this Wayne Cook exercise is used when you're feeling brain fog, brain fatigue, and scattered. It can assist with that. Inhale in and exhale. Excellent, shake it out. All right, last two quick exercises. One hand up, this is called the push and pull. One hand to the sky, you push. One hand to the earth, you pull. Flip around, push and pull. You're lengthening your side body. You can even do this one sitting down. Push and pull really quick, really easy. Last one is called the crown pull. You can do the crown pull standing or sitting. When you have a headache, when you feel so much information is coming at you, this is the technique to use. You take your fingers, place them in the middle of your forehead and simply pull and then you work up your forehead to the top of your head. Oftentimes, we have so much information in our brains, there's a blood flowing to our, our head, to our cranium, right? So what you're doing is, is a bit of acupressure. It's a bit of self-massage. You continue going all the way, starting at your forehead and going all the way to the top of your head for the crown. So those are some quick energy techniques and boosters for you to use anytime throughout your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Christine, so much. Thanks for being on again. I really appreciate it. And we're dropping Christine's contact information, Crow Practice. It's in the chat right now with her email and her uh, website. Christine, thank you again. Thank you. Um, I am so happy to have Deborah coming on with me right now, Deborah Boggs, and she's going to be focused on job hunting. I know there's been a lot of questions about job hunting. So um, we're real excited to be kicking off with that. But before we bring her on for this, I'm going to ask a quick polling question. And um, give me a second. To... Ask the next question. This is uh, my first time of launching. I don't see poll number two. And give me a second to try to get there. Here it is. OK. I wish I had the music that they go. So right now, have, your, have all your questions been answered so far? Just wanna get all your stuff. If you say no on this, I'm gonna challenge you. This is just a, a really great reminder for you to keep you engaged that getting what you need to get out of these webinars is a joint responsibility. I need to make sure you guys are asking your questions so we're able to answer them. If I can't answer them right away, you're gonna get that I'd, I'm gonna answer it live while we're live. So listen for me answering it live, it will happen. Um, but if you're answering no, please make sure that you are putting your questions in so that you get what you came on for today answered. Okay, so we have 59% of you. I need a few more of you to respond to this so that I can close this out. Right now it's at 59%, I need to get to 80%. So it's a group effort here. We're at 63%, come on team. Go participants, we have a lot of you guys on. We need, need you guys to answer so that we're able to move forward with the show. We're at 68%. A few more of you are answering. We're now at 72%. I need a few more of you guys so I can keep going. Uh, Christine, you're getting a whole bunch of thank yous on there. For, it was great, so excellent. Um, really refresher, thank you for doing that. Uh, thanks you guys for putting the thanks, thank yous in there. Okay, we're at 74%. I need a few more. I'd like to end this poll and get going with job hunting. So I need you guys to respond. Show me you're engaged and you're here and present and on the call and either you're getting questions answered or you're not getting them done. This is as easy as the questions come. We're at 76%. Need a couple more of you guys to respond in order to get that up to my 80%. Come on. 
Let's get the show on the road. I need a few more of you to respond. Come on. I know you're there. We're almost there. We're almost there. Let's go, guys. Okay, we hit it, 80%. Here's the response. I'm sharing the results live. 92% of you said yes, and uh, we have 3% of you that said no. I'm gonna remind you to please, please, please make sure you're asking your questions. Deborah, glad to have you on. I know you're gonna go into some of the um, kind of like how can job seekers use LinkedIn to find opportunities. That's gonna be really important, but I wanna ask you a couple questions before that happens, um, just about stuff that people were asking about your earlier presentation. Would you use a black and white photo or colored photos for the profile pictures, or do you have a recommendation either way? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually have uh, an answer to that because they've done studies uh, based on what performs best with the audience. And when I say they, I mean LinkedIn. And um, actually black and white versus color had no bearing on audience response. So, you know, if you prefer a black and white photo or if you have a crazy colored shirt on that day or whatever, um, black and white versus color doesn't matter. Perfect, thank you for that. And then also, um, you do you know how, how about using LinkedIn stories? Can you give any ideas about what those could be used for? Yeah, so um, kind of, I you know, when, uh, when Maria talks more about um, LinkedIn or about Instagram, she might be able to tell about what a story is in general because I don't use Instagram very much. It's a little bit of an enigma to me. It just launched last week. So it's brand new on the LinkedIn platform. And so to, to be honest with you in the LinkedIn expert world, we're all commiserating about LinkedIn stories and how we would use them and how people would use them, um, you know, whether they're job seekers or, or um, you know, thought leaders or, or uh, using it for business development. We don't see a ton of value yet. I would love um, Ms. Ben's uh, response to that too, but honestly, I, I don't get it yet. Um, I haven't seen a ton of value. Perfect. And then the last thing I wanted to ask before we kick into your presentation is, um, do you have any, for as far as LinkedIn uh, profiles go, and if you're going to be using it for business development, if there's a, an agency, a larger agency, do you think the business development thing would be a benefit? And maybe that's, maybe this is a Valerie because you know the, tra I think it's a travel agency um, that's going to be using it since she knows the business, maybe this is uh, better for her. But one of the two of you, if it's travel agency, they're not sure if they should pay for LinkedIn for business development or not. And they're just asking for feedback. Hmm. And I think Valerie did a great job of kind of showing what you can do with it for free. And then there's a lot more you can do it for it for not free. And you can try it for 30 days, Tanya. So I would think that you that from that you should be able to get some benefit from it. It is costly as a small company. I've been using the 30 days for free sporadically, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't invest the money in it personally. I would suggest, um, you know, do the 30 days for free with that 30 days. You also get access to all of LinkedIn learnings training and LinkedIn learning has a lot of great training on how to use your premium subscription, how to use your sales navigator. So, so sign on for the 30 days if you're interested in seeing whether it makes sense for you and then do the um, watch the trainings that are that are through uh, LinkedIn learning and that way you understand how to use it. You can see if you get any value from it, you know, just plan to plan to to sign up for that 30 days when you're really ready to hit the ground running to see if it makes sense for your business. Perfect. Now dig in now job seekers using LinkedIn to find opportunities. This is the big deal here. So let's dive in. All right, so I want to talk about not only how to find the opportunities, but how to make sure you're standing out on the platform. You know, as we all know, the job market is very different than it was six months ago. And so there's some things we can do to really stand out. And so we're going to go through some of those things. But first of all, when you're job hunting on LinkedIn, I know, you know, we want to talk a little bit about keywords. So on LinkedIn, um, you know, up here in the, you know, on everyone's profile in the upper sort of right hand corner, like towards the top, you've got jobs. And there you can search by title, skill, company, as you can see here, city, state, zip code. Um, you can set up job alerts for certain, um, for certain searches. What I suggest doing is make sure you keep your search as broad as possible, because if we narrow our search too far, we miss opportunities because say you're looking for project manager, and in fact, a lot of jobs say project management or if you're looking for, um, you know, a catering, um, catering director, uh, you know, maybe it might be director of catering. You want to just make sure you're staying really broad uh, because you could miss out on opportunities. And same thing with the location. Um, if you are in a role that could be done remotely, um, 
and I know it's a little bit harder in hospitality, but if, if that is the case for some of you, um, you know, there is an option instead of doing city, state, or zip code, you can just put remote in there. That's bizarrely a fairly new um, function on LinkedIn. It's only been an option for about uh, nine or 10 months now. Um, but you can search by remote, but just make sure that you're, you're staying really broad with the, with the skill, the title, the company. And what I like to do is if there's a couple different options that you could maybe look for in a job, you know, do this, do the search, um, you know, do a few different searches and then save them by once you, once you um, start the search and then all the um, examples come up or all the job options come up, then hit job alerts. That way you can set it to something you'll get an alert for every time, either every time a new job is listed or every time, or, or you can set it to be daily where they'll send all the new jobs once a day or once a week. So that's okay. But that way, you know, uh, kind of like Valerie had mentioned about, you know, being one of the first um, salespeople to reach out on, a, on an opportunity, you want to be one of the first candidates to reach out on a job opportunity. You really want to be in there as early as possible. So the job alerts can be helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a job posted right now um, for an operations meeting manager that I've been trying to hire for. And it is overwhelming. I, I have over 200, actually today I have over 350 uh, resumes that I've just received in the last oh, wow. week. And so um, it is definitely overwhelming uh, looking through all of those things. So I'm, I'm saying like, I can, can you tell a candidate that's one of those 350 people that are, that are in my queue, how can they stand out for that job? Great question. So a couple of ways. And so what we want to do, and Valerie set this up so perfectly, so thank you so much um, about showing how to find the company and things like that, because we're going to talk about that. So once you see a job online, you really want to apply for it, you know, you, you click on it. Um, can we go back to the last slide real quick? Just, just for a second, sorry. Um, so anyway, while we're getting back to the last slide, um, the what you're going to want to do is when you see the job description, a lot of times it'll say in there who that job reports to. So if it's a larger company, um, you may want to, oh, well, we're moving along, whatever, that's fine. Um, if it's a larger company, you may want to, um, you know, go into the company, uh, the company page like Valerie had showed us, look at the, um, at the employees and then in the employees section, exactly where, where Valerie had already kind of walked through how to get to, in the employees section, pull up and then do a search by either that person's title, if you know who the job reports to, or look for someone if it's a smaller organization like president, CEO, or, or HR leader, or a lot of larger companies will have internal recruiters. So look for, you know, kind of mess around in there to try to find the right person or the right group of people and um, connect with them on LinkedIn. And when you connect, add a message in the connection request that says, you know, hey, I just saw that you, you know, have this role open. I've, I've already applied online. I'd love to express my interest personally, whatever. Because that allows you to get a human conversation going and allows you to, you know, it, then when they see your profile, so when they see your request come through, they're going to automatically see your profile. And that's where we're going to want to make sure that we're putting our best foot forward in our profiles, because we want people like Michelle, who has 350 resumes to look through, to say, oh, this person has exactly what I'm looking for. Look at their headline. They do everything I need. Um, I've, been, I've been trying to be thoughtful through this process. I'm literally trying to connect with every single person that sent me a resume um, that fits the job description. So I'm perfect. really opening up their profile and looking at it. But it's amazing to me how many people... Some people have accepted it. Some people haven't accepted it. And hmm. they just, they, they literally have communicated via in, in mail, that the Valerie yeah. in mail thing, which I don't really look at a whole lot. So I'm using the, the LinkedIn jobs things to find people, to find candidates, but my communications moving from there, once I find the candidates to a, an email correspondence or an actual correspondence via LinkedIn versus uh, in mail. Right. So that being said, I do think connecting with me, like some uh, people have done personal ones, has been very helpful, but it's also overwhelming to have 200 people send you personal messages and then ask you, because, you know, I think some of the feedbacks that we be given is like, you know, engage them and ask some questions. But if I have 200 people engaging me to ask me questions about this one job, it's very, very difficult and I feel overwhelmed. Right. And I'd be interested to know how many people have reached out because, because, overwhelmingly people don't reach out. And so you're one of a handful of people who reach out versus the majority. But it's have you been, been the getting- The majority, that? yeah, the majority. And it may be because our industry has been so focused on, um, you know, I mean, we've been out since March, our industry, the meetings, the hospitality right. has shut down. 
So I think, I feel like we've been sitting for a long period of time and we're really feel isolated and wanting to get out and connect. So I just think that they're ready to go. And a lot of those that have been furloughed and laid off for this period of time are also ready to get back to work get right. out of the house and get and get back to some normalcy. Yeah. So I do think that that's part of it. And I think there's a couple ways, and you bring up a really great point about not wanting to overwhelm or ask things of the hiring manager. I mean, you know, we're there, you know, as a, as a candidate, we're there to offer value and not to add something to their to-do list, right? And so I think, you know, once they connect, so you, you add in your message or your connection request, what, you know, why you're connecting so that they don't just ignore you. And then in the message, once they connect, you can respond with a message that says, thanks so, so much for connecting. It's great to meet you. For your convenience, I've added my resume here. Here are three bullet points of, um, you know, of my past experience that relates to this job or ways I can hit the ground running. Or maybe say, hey, I looked at your website and I noticed XYZ I'd love to help you with. Something that adds value, something that shows that you're thinking about their business. Um, that you're ready to hit the ground running, that you're not asking anything of them. You're just, here's all the information to make it easy for you. Here's how I fit this position. Love to get started. And then to kind of piggyback off of some of the things Valerie was mentioning, the other thing that's really important is after you make a connection, you want to engage with that connection's posts and content and things like that. So if they post things, um, you know, uh, respond, make a comment. Um, comments help your connections a lot with their engagement on their posts. So, you know, not just liking their posts because, you know, you can get lost in the crowd there, but, but leave a thoughtful comment showing that you're thinking about their business or that you're thinking about the industry because that helps you stand out from the crowd too because not only have I now connected with Michelle, then I sent her, you know, the way I can add value to her job, her job opening, and now I'm connecting with her, her, her um, engagement. And I will say, Aretha Garman is on this, um, on this call right now just because I know because she, she is literally the master at connecting with people and then engaging thoughtfully in their content to become like ingrained. Like, we've never spoken. I feel like she's a close friend of mine now. I feel like <laughs> I could reach out to her for anything. Um, so if anyone's curious on how to do this, reach out to Aretha. She is literally amazing at this. And I, I would tell you like when, when I have people that have commented on my post, I actually go in and will look at their profile and mm -hmm. it, it makes me more curious about them when they take the time to be curious about me. You know that saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I think it's right. really important that, that if you're wanting to be engaged with somebody that you show you care about something they're interested in and in, engage in that manner uh, authentically. So that's really um, fantastic. So talk a little bit more if you can about other ways they can stand out in a crowd. So we can we have the personalization of some uh, messages. We have the um, offering a solution uh, to mm -hmm. them. Um, offering a solution so you send a message about a solution or maybe some article or summarize all of your stuff in one thing if you're looking for a job what else can they do to stand out in this environment yeah so a couple things um i want to i want to talk about um per linkedin premium for job seekers specifically so valerie did a great job kind of talking about it from the business development standpoint and the sales standpoint as a job seeker, um, my approach is a little bit different because the, the value that you get out of a premium account is a little bit different. And so um, it is worth signing up for at least for the 30 days free um, for a couple of reasons. If, you're, if you have a premium account as a job seeker, which is the lowest level, um, so the lowest paid option. So um, I, don't quote me because I have a business um, premium profile, so I, I can't see what the other levels are, but it's around $35 a month. Um, if you pay monthly for the for the job seeker version or the it's a, called LinkedIn career. But what you get is you show up higher in the list of candidates who have applied, um, which can be really helpful, uh, especially if like Michelle's job, you have 350 candidates, um, you want to show up higher in that search. You also, um, if the job poster has elected you to be able to, you can see who posted the job. So the internal recruiter or the HR person or the job or the hiring manager or president, depending on the size of the company. So you can see that person and that way you don't have to go searching of like, oh, who would I reach out to? Who do I need to respond to? You'll know and you can reach out to them directly. Um, the other thing is, you know, as we're, because we do need to be searching and reaching out to everyone and doing our best to stand out, we want to make sure that we, um, that we have enough ability to do searches and the free version of LinkedIn, um, you only have so many searches per month. So you can only look up so many people. Um, before LinkedIn will lock you out and you'll have to wait till next month to be able to do any more searches. So if you're searching for a certain company to see like, oh, who's their internal 
a recruiter or who is their HR person or whatever, um, you'll run out of the ability to do that once you start really using LinkedIn for a purpose rather than just kind of everyday networking. Um, and so with the LinkedIn premium, you get unlimited searches. And, and that's really important for a job seeker who's really, you know, using it hard to build their network. So those are just some reasons why, you know, if you have the ability to and you've got, um, if you've got the budget, it does help move the needle for job seekers. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. And I would say, you know, going back to your original question about standing out, you know, it's really more about continuing to add value. Um, I was on a great call the other day where um, a job, um, job search um, team was talking about ways to stand out in the job market, especially online. And one of those things is, you know, when you, um, you know, uh, referrals really help a lot too. And so Valerie had made a great point about, um, you know, trying to see if you have any connections in common. You know, it's really helpful if it's a large company like Hilton or something like that, you know, look in your connections and see if you have anybody in common um, and see if you can get a referral into the company because that's always helpful too. Or if you have any connections in common with that person after you've connected, is there anyone that can introduce you to make a human, human introduction? So any of those things tend to be helpful as well. And then just, um, you know, Oh, yeah. Can you answer real quick, how important is LinkedIn recommenda recommendations for, um, you know, for job candidates, for people seeking jobs? Oh, okay. So a recommendation for, um, so like on the profile, a recommendation like under the skills section? Yeah, they're, they're asking, you know, for LinkedIn recommendations, does that help? And do these mm -hmm. help make you stand out in a competitive field? Yeah, so they do a couple things. They move the needle a little bit in terms of search optimization. So they show up, they help you show up in, you know, they, they move for a, from an SEO standpoint, they help a little bit. But what they really do is they allow you to, to add third party social proof of the fact that you're, you know, nice and competent and, you know, don't kick puppies and things like that. So uh, the way that we, you know, would say we're detail oriented and, you know, and, and a team player and blah, 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 it, it kind of falls flat because we can talk about those things all day. But if someone else says it about us, it really holds a lot more weight. And so it's really the most authentic way to be able to add soft skills to your profile. Um, and the other thing is not a ton of people use the recommendation section. So that immediately gives you the opportunity to stand out above other candidates because so many people don't have recommendations or they'll have very old recommendations to jobs that are no longer relevant to what they do. So if you have recent recommendations, that really helps you stand out. And then the other thing I want to, yeah. we're going to have us move to the next slide, which is the about section to discuss that uh, briefly. But mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you one more question while we're doing that is about keywords. Um, and I, are you going to cover that in this area here? Or yeah, well, later? when we talk about keywords for search optimization for your profile, right? Yeah. There's questions yeah. about that. So if you're already going to talk about it, then I don't want to address it here because I want to be cognitive of this time because of uh, Maria's time. Um, but I do have another question is skills from other industries. So if somebody is a hospitality person right now in whatever job role they are, but hospitality doesn't have any more, a lot of jobs that are open. So they're thinking about wanting to try a different industry. How can they use LinkedIn to connect that their connect to those those new types of jobs and I think I feel like it goes back to the the keywords right. that's what I think it goes back to is making sure the keywords are in in place and can, can you speak to that a little bit yeah absolutely so yes in so a couple things and that actually great segue into the about section because we'll definitely talk about keywords here a um, couple things the if you're if you're looking to transition into a new field what I suggest doing is in your about section um, telling that story of, you know, after a, after a, you know, great career in hospitality, looking to transition into the blah, 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 here are my transferable skills, you know, it, it, customer service, key account management, sales and business development, things like that. So adding all of the transferable skills that would be necessary in the new role, make sure that you have a target though, make sure you have a target, either industry or role to make sure that you're not just leaving it open to everything because that's not as effective as having something hyper-focused. Um, the other thing, though, is, you know, if you're transitioning to a new industry is um, add new um, new training and courses, certification programs, anything you can do. There's a ton of low cost options online. Um, LinkedIn Learning has a ton of options. So if you pay for the for the premium, even as a job seeker, you get access to LinkedIn Learning and then you can add them directly to your LinkedIn profile. So as you finish courses, add them to your LinkedIn profile. They show up in the um, certifications and licensing section, and they can immediately show value of, oh, okay, she not only, you know, has um, 
you know, business development experience, but she's also taken this course on in my industry or whatever. And it helps with the keywords and it also shows that you're actively doing something, you know, while you're off and you're working on transitioning. So I think both those things are helpful. Another couple options for low cost courses, um, udemy.com, U-D-E-M-Y.com and Coursera are both great options as well. So those are things people might want to think about as they're looking at transitioning. Um, and in the about section, so this is, um, so we already talked about, you know, headline, background photo, um, profile photo. Now the about section is the summary of your career, basically. And a lot of people, now mine is, this is mine and it's optimized as a, as a business, um, you know, this isn't as a job seeker. So this is optimized for me as a, as a, as a business and looking for lead generation. But for job seekers or, or lead generation, what you wanna know is this first picture, this about section at the top, is that's what people see um, before they click on anything else, especially in the desktop version. They only see the first three lines. So you wanna make sure that those first three lines get all of the pertinent information out that you can or is engaging because unless they click to see more, that's all they're gonna see. So make sure that you're really maximizing um, that space. And then when you go to write the rest of your, your about section, I don't expect you to be able to read this. I know the writing is really small. I just want you to see the layout. Short sentences, short paragraphs, bullets, lists, things like that make it really easy to read because no one cares about our content like we do. Literally, we are the only people who are ever gonna read our about section word for word. Everyone else is skimming very, very quickly. And so we wanna make sure as they skim, they get all the information immediately. So. You know, for job seekers, I like to say, you know, have a little blurb about what's going on, you know, their career, and then, um, and then, you know, uh, my career highlights include, and then a couple bullets about your highlights, um, you know, a little bit about your education, and then at the bottom, I've got specialties include, or you could say key skills include, or something like this, and put all the keywords you want to be found for right here. And you I, know, I would also, also, I just also want to bring up Deborah. It's really important. A lot of people don't put on how to contact them. And I think oh, yeah. it's important to make that very clear in this space and really just looking throughout your profile that you have very clear information about how somebody can contact you. There's another question. How do you feel about that open to work on your profile when you are furloughed or possibly even laid off? So I don't like it. Um, it doesn't move the needle much in you showing up in additional recruiter searches. And it's um, a lot of a lot of job seekers, unfortunately, face a bias against being unemployed. Um, it, I could get on a soapbox and talk about that all day, but I won't. Um, but you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage by by just you know showing up as unemployed. I think it's it's more helpful to show your value and what you're doing in your industry and how you're staying up to date on what's going on or how you're transitioning to a new industry than it is to brand yourself with that big that big green circle saying that you're unemployed, basically. Um, so I. Think my, my viewpoint on that too is, is I'm not as fond as the open to work as open to network. So anybody mm -hmm. that sends me anything that has open to network in their profile, I accept it right away. And open to network could be open to jobs as well. But I do yeah. think to Deborah's point, you don't, I, while in our industry, most people know what we've gone through and that most people right. haven't been working for months. It, you can add value by talking about what you have been doing versus what mm -hmm. you have not been doing. So the volunteering, maybe you're um, you've taken some educational classes or you've taken an internship, whatever you've done, that adds value that you weren't just sitting around the entire time. And those are the things I think you wanna focus on uh, through that. I think that's for you, Tracy. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And then is, it, is a shared alma mater a good thing to mention when you are reaching out to a hiring manager? Um, it doesn't hurt. I mean, anything you can find that's uh, that's a you know uh, um, that you guys did you know is helpful. I even will say I, I'm a sociology grad, which is kind of weird, and so sometimes I'll bring that up, like, oh, hey, great job, you know, we're one of the sociology grads that don't live in our parents' basement, you know, things like that. Um, so I think anywhere you can find commonality, um, I you know, is, is helpful in an authentic way. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to ask you to talk about some of the experience section and, and move quickly through uh, experience, education, and certificate and license. Yep, we'll go through this really, really quickly. I just wanna talk about the experience section. This is where you, um, you know, for each of your roles, um, in the title section, a couple things that I wanna talk about here is this is really heavily weighted for keywords as well. So if you have a title or your past title for roles wasn't, um, maybe wasn't typical for the industry or doesn't really match the industry you're going into, you can add a few more words to show more, you know, information about what you actually do. 
So for me, my title, you know, is probably co-founder, um, but I'm an executive resume writer and a LinkedIn profile writer. And that's what I want to be found for in LinkedIn. And that's what I want people to understand that I do. So I put that in my title section too, just to maximize that space. Um, for all of you who have maybe recently um, become unemployed, I just want to say this real quick. Um, don't, don't change your employment date. Leave present as employed because you're going to show up in more recruiter sec um, uh, searches than if you end that. You won't come up in their searches anymore if you end your employment. What I suggest you do if you've been laid off due to COVID or anything that's happened since then is leave present in your employment, but then in your little blurb underneath of it, say um, laid off you know, due to COVID. That way you're not lying about your experience, but you're, you're maximizing the opportunity to show up in searches. Um, education. Right. What I want to talk about in education in two seconds is number one, make sure that your alma mater um, logo shows up by, by uh, Valerie had mentioned it before of, you know, if you don't click on the right company correctly or, or organization, it may not show up. Make sure your organization shows up that way you get logo recognition. The other thing you want to do is um, a lot of people who didn't finish a degree for a lot of reasons, you know, it's totally fine. But if you, if you didn't finish a degree, some people will say, you know, studied finance or studied hospitality or whatever. Um, I suggest if you didn't finish a degree, just take it out because um, people won't miss education, but they will notice if it raises a question like, oh, I wonder if they graduated. Just take it out. It's not hurting anything by removing it. Um, if you did finish a degree, make sure that degree is clear because if it just says studied sociology, people are going to wonder, oh, did you graduate or not? So make sure that that's clear. Perfect. And thank you. The licenses and certification, we talked a little bit about this. The ones with LinkedIn next to it are the ones I got on LinkedIn Learning. Um, you know, especially especially if you either don't have formal degree education or if you're transitioning or if you've been laid off, this is a great opportunity to beef up your profile, show that you've been busy, show that you've been staying on top of best practices, but make sure that what you list is relevant. I saw a job seeker the other day list um, a license and certification from LinkedIn Learning that was on salary negotiation. That's not helpful. For a job seeker to tell the world you've been beefing up on uh, salary negotiation, not helpful. So make sure you can take any training you want, but maybe just only add the ones that are relevant to your profile. Yeah, it was weird. <laughs> um, okay, we talked about recommendations already, so we can skip this, but it is helpful. Um, you can ask for recommendations but to anyone you're already connected with. And then the accomplishment section, these are like extra credit. So any courses you're taking. So, you know, even things like webinars, you can add uh, this webinar. Everyone can add it to their courses. Um, organizations, this is a great option, especially if you're maybe switching um, careers. If you add organizations to the new industry you're switching to or that you've been, you know, involved in other organizations, those are great to add there too. And then publications. Um, guys, I add uh, not only media mentions in here, and this is really more for, for um, uh, using it for business development. I add media mentions in here, but also speaking engagements. If you've done any speaking engagements, there's no other place for that in the accomplishments section, so I add it under publications. Perfect. Right. And then finally, extra credit. Um, this really isn't necessary for job seekers, but it does help beef up your profile if you're using it for business development. You can add your website here, add links to videos, maybe videos of you speaking. For me, I use my website, my media mentions, um, you can also add uh, LinkedIn articles here that you've written, or you can you can um, tag, uh, like uh, pin um, posts here too that you want to come up again. So these are, like I said, this is better for um, business development. It comes up, give you an idea, it comes up right below your about section. Um, so it's like one of the top things and it comes up before experience. So it does have a lot of real estate. And for me, I just use it um, to drive traffic to my website. Beautiful. Okay, so the last thing I think I wanted to talk about is, um, in your opinion, are there any specific insights that you can share about regions when it comes to job hunting, such as the Americas versus Middle East versus some other area? Um, sure. So do you mean job hunting in general or using LinkedIn specifically? I'm thinking LinkedIn is because this is our, our topic, social media. So I'm going to narrow it into the social media arena. And this is an anonymous attendee, so I have no idea. I'm assuming they're from out of the country. And that's oh, why okay. they're asking that question. But. Yes, um, to whoever um, is asking, reach out to me personally on LinkedIn. And I'm happy to give some more, um, con uh, some more like specific details to this because it's a really broad topic. And I could definitely talk in, you know, in length about a lot of these things. but. Um, if you're searching for a role internationally, um, 
it helps to, you know, really try to grow your connection wherever you're, wherever you're looking. Um, so, you know, if, if you don't have any connections in that area, then it's a little bit hard to know about potential roles that are coming up and things like that. I will say, you know, most LinkedIn, um, the, the biggest uh, group of LinkedIn users is in the US, obviously it was started here, but it is definitely growing. Um, Asia is really, really growing in their use of LinkedIn. The Middle East is really, really growing. I have a lot of clients in the Middle East and in Europe, and, uh, and I do know that LinkedIn is a big part of their job search uh, as well. I know I looked literally um, a couple days ago for a group I spoke to in Pakistan, um, and they had, I think, 400,000 jobs listed in Pakistan right now on the LinkedIn network, so it's still worth using. You just may not get as much engagement and things like that as you would in the US, but it's definitely still an important part of your job search. Thank you, Deborah, very much. I really appreciate it. I feel like I rushed you through your piece of it, but we're going to have you stay on at the very end. So those of you that have more questions um, for Deborah, please um, stay on. And after we bring Maria Benz on here, um, we'll, we'll add Deborah back on. So Maria, welcome to the show. I'm glad to have you here. And I know we've been mostly talking about LinkedIn. And I was super excited to find you as having expertise in both Instagram and Facebook. And just talk to us a little bit about using that from a standpoint of branding yourself and not personally branding, but professionally branding, whether you're a company or you, or do you incorporated? Mm -hmm, um, how, mm -hmm. what's, what's the best way to use that? So I'm super excited to chat with you guys today because I will say uh, among all the social media, I'm definitely more well-versed in Instagram and Facebook compared to LinkedIn. And so I have a digital marketing agency that specializes in website design and our top areas of lead generation, like most people probably is referrals, but a big, big percentage is Instagram and Facebook and specifically stories. So I know we had a question about that. So I'm excited to chat kind of what has been working for stories. That's a big part of the topic. And I am personally very interested in kind of dabbling into LinkedIn stories and see if kind of the same things work on, um, on in, in, uh, LinkedIn and stories as well. Perfect. Can you tell us but, a little bit about branding and like why it's important? Yeah, of course. So before we kind of dive into the juicy details, so branding, when you think of a brand, a professional brand or a company, um, a lot of people kind of instantly think like of a logo, right? But it's not just a logo or a product you sell. It's how people perceive you. Um, what do they think about when they see your profile? Because I think you guys can probably relate when you're looking at certain profiles, we immediately subconsciously get certain thoughts, right? About, you know, judging them almost based on their profile. So when someone lands on your Instagram or Facebook uh, profile, a user has less than 10 seconds. Um, typically they make a decision less than 10 seconds whether or not they want to follow you. So thinking about that, and I think you know that makes sense with LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook when you're talking about that, when someone lands onto your profile, really think about what do you want your profile to say? How can you show the true value that you can bring to your users? So that's something, a question that I want to post to you as we're talking through these, through these topics. So what, what do people miss out on their profiles when it's not clear? So if you are not clear on your profiles, you are missing out on leads. So Instagram and Facebook, uh, could very well be the new business card. I've been to a business conference um, in last October, and I was amazed to see how many people were, hey, what's your Instagram? What's your Instagram? And we were connecting that way. And I feel like everyone has their plat a social media platform of choice. But on Instagram specifically, something that I see when I log on to um, to either colleagues' profiles or a new lead that shows up, or even when I'm searching for a type of service. Sometimes I go onto their profile and I don't understand clearly what they do. Sometimes people, you know, have some wishy-washy words, but you want to be very, very clear on who you are, what you do, and who you help. So for instance, for us, that could be like, we are website design and SEO, SEO experts. So something very, very simple, but it's very clear on what we do. Um, a second thing is having a very strong visual presence 
on, and this is very important for Instagram because Instagram is a very visual platform. So a strong visual presence means that when someone logs onto your Instagram profile, that they are um, enticed by the pictures that you post. So you want your pictures to have good quality uh, photos. You don't want blurry photos. You want good lighting. And preferably, if you know how to edit pictures, you want them to edit in a similar way because aesthetically, it's a little bit more um, aesthetically pleasing to the eye and it draws people in. And then when someone clicks on a photo, you really want to provide value to your potential customers and leads. So you want to, and we'll kind of dive deeper into this, but you really want to kind of um, have introductory captions that talk about your business. So for example, for us, if we're a website design and SEO, I may add some tips of what people can do to their website, right? For you guys, you can talk about some tips that people can use for events, event planning, virtual events, things like that. So, and I, this is more probably what you're, you're going to be talking about is using it for business. Because a lot of people don't think of Instagram and Facebook instantly from a business standpoint. They think of it as more social. Mm -hmm. and, and I do see some, I search, so you know, anybody that I'm going to potentially hire or even engage with, I do a search online for them. So I don't just check LinkedIn, but I check Facebook, Instagram, Twitter to see who they are. And, and so this is where I think it's really important that you have branded yourself in a way, what you put out there is what people are going to know about you. Mm -hmm. You are controlling what you're putting out there in a, in a way that it, it's what you're wanting to put. So if you want to talk about divisive su uh, subjects, that's fine. As long as that's what you want the world to know about you is that that's what you want to talk about. Um, if you want to uh, share pictures of you partying, that's fine too. And we want people that enjoy life. But if, if you want people and that's public and you want people to know that about you, that's fine. But if you're trying to move into a business, a professional realm in that, and we're doing a search and we see that, I can tell you that that has affected my decisions on even interviewing somebody. Yeah, I can, I can agree with you on that. Um, a lot of people, like they do think of Instagram as a social social platform and it can be social, but if you are either building a business or if you are looking to grow in this industry, it is such a great platform to show your authority and your expertise in the industry. Um, and it's grown, it's helped grown our business so much. And I've seen so many uh, colleagues in various industries, it's helped as well. But um, one of the key things for uh, Instagram and Facebook is first, like I mentioned, your feed and your bio is what initially draws people into your profile. They might click on it and whether your pictures are pretty or your bio explains, you know, that you can help them solve their problem, they start following you. So your feed is essentially, you know, something that draws people in that people want to kind of get to know you more. Um, but showing up on stories helps create trust and curiosity about your brand. So this is when they really start getting to know you. And the whole goal and something that I use, my goal with uh, Instagram and Facebook is to start a conversation around what I do. So, and my goal with Instagram is really to drive, <laughs> drive leads to our business. But something that I want to focus on today is Instagram stories. So on Instagram, on the Instagram platform, stories are viewed much, much more than the feed. People are still scrolling a little bit, but more often than not, they are viewing stories because it's a lot more engaging. It's video. They can see text. They can see pictures, moving pictures. It's a lot more, I guess, fun <laughs> to view. But when people are viewing your story, it has that personal connection almost as if, almost as if they're one-on-one -on -one with you. So it helps create a relationship um, based on the variety of posts that you do, because it really helps within that um, like or no and trust factor. And then essentially stories helps drive sales. Absolutely. And I have a couple questions while we're on. You can stay on this slide, but I want to just ask you for individuals, for an individual, do you feel employers are checking their Facebook, Instagram as much as they're checking LinkedIn? And I'll say for me, I check everything. Mm -hmm. That's for me. But how about your opinion on other employers that are using? They just I think ab oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, I know when I've made hires, I went directly <laughs> to Instagram because I knew that that was like Instagram and Twitter, right? That's when you really see who they are at, <laughs> at their core. But if you want to post personal um, 
personal things, I would definitely make your profile private because then they won't really have much access unless the only thing they'll be able to see is your profile picture, your name, and your bio. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. So then somebody's asking about keeping Instagram for personal and LinkedIn for work and job hunt. That's really a personal decision on how you want to set that up. But I would say that that I do think Facebook and Instagram are more of social, more casual things, but we're showing you that now it's being used for business. And for me, I use it for business and I have, I used to have a separate business page and then a separate Michelle Hardy page. Um, and I've combined them now because it was just so much to post in one area and post in the other. And then some of my, my uh, colleagues and my clients have friends and so they're over on the friend page too and just, mm -hmm. it's just a lot to manage so I combine them both together and I do teeter a line between you know I mean I just had my uh, anniversary yesterday um, so do I post something on the anniversary on that but, and I did I think I think you have to so it, it creates a connection mm -hmm. for me to share some of those personal things and people to be able to share in some of those great things that I celebrate and they get a chance to celebrate along with me especially during this time frame yeah. But I probably wouldn't post on there um, my thoughts on, I don't know, something else that would be a divisive thing. That's what I'm trying to say. It's just yes. really want to be careful on that. But I do think a best practice, Maria, is what you said is about keeping them separate where you have a, a, um, a Facebook or a, a LinkedIn page or, or an a Instagram page. LinkedIn that you keep as private if you're wanting to post private information so that only your closest friends see that piece of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know. I agree with you. And if you do use Instagram for business, I'm like you, I like, I include a little bit of person in person, uh, personal stuff in there because it shows a little bit of your personality and it helps create that where they start liking you, right? If someone starts following you and they might, you know, might be a good lead, they're kind of getting to know who you are to see if they would want to work with you. But when you kind of uh, interweave a little bit of personal things, if it makes sense, then they really start feeling like they have a personal connection with you. Yeah, I think it's important. And do you mm -hmm. have any idea about the best time to post um, stuff on Instagram? Is there so a that is a great time? question and it really depends on you. So on your Instagram settings, if you go onto your settings tab, there's an analytics and it will show you when your specific followers are most active. It'll show you the days, the times. So I would base it um, on each personal person. Oh, that's fantastic. I didn't even know that that existed. Yeah. <laughs> so can you talk just a little bit about the kind of content that they should post on this? Yes. Let's talk about what not to post. Yes. So if you are using Instagram stories and um, Facebook stories for business, which I highly, highly recommend, um, like I said, it's been 20 to 30% of our business within the last two years. So it's, and it's just been growing. So I like highly, highly, highly recommend, but the type of stories that I've seen have the best engagement is one educational. So tips, tricks, um, tutorials, and this really helps show people that you have authority in your industry and that you know what you're talking about. Um, and then the next thing is informative content. So maybe you have industry news, um, or company news that would be interesting to your followers. And again, you, at this point, um, I would work on following people in your industry, following people that could be your potential leads, connecting with them very much so how you would connect on LinkedIn so that you're posting for the right people. Um, the third thing is relatable content. This is actually probably the most engaged um, thing that I see for us and for our colleagues is behind the scenes, kind of the business. Sometimes I'll show videos of our team working together, you know, at a coffee shop or in the office or showing how we set up our podcast studio, things like that. It's kind of related to your business, but it's a little bit personal. People love seeing that. So for events, if you're, you know, um, if you're setting up for uh, an event, the decor, putting everything on, people are so interested to see what all of that is about. So I highly, highly recommend just showing behind the scenes um, next, also very important is content that creates dialogue. So call to actions. How can you help them? Anything that basically will have people engage with you or respond back. Um, and either they will privately message you, or you can do a poll, you can do questions, anything that will create dialogue with them that you can start talking to them. And then lastly, but not least is about your business. So you want to show what you do too. 
So you want to show maybe client results. Maybe you want to show before and after pictures of, you know, the work that you've done. Maybe you want to show client testimonials, video client testimonials have done so, so well as well. I've had so many people respond back when I posted an Instagram story with a client doing a video for us. So these are the top key things that I've seen work so well on stories and I'm excited to try them out on LinkedIn stories as well. Perfect. Thank you for that. And I'm going to have you talk about the beginning, the middle and the end. What are you referring to here? Yes. So when talking about stories, you may be a little bit overwhelmed if you're not used to showing up on camera and, you know, posting something. So you might be like, I don't even know where to start. So, start so when you are thinking about stories, so stories is like a story, right? And a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So in the beginning, you want to start off with what is your story about? What are you talking about? What, you know, you can be like, hey, my name is Maria, and today I'm going to show you the behind the scenes of our studio. So they know what they're getting into so that if they're not interested, they can swipe along and, you know, not, not look. But if they are interested, they know what they're getting into. The middle is where your meat and potatoes are. And you want to keep this short. Um, they're 15 seconds long. Um, a, a story that you can do is 15 seconds long. And say, for example, if I did three tips on how you can get leads from your website. Um, my middle would be the first tip, second, and third. But my recommendation is keep that first tip within that 15 seconds, which I know could be hard to do. But you want to be fast because Instagram is very, very fast paced and you don't want one tip to drag on for three or four stories. Um, so when you're in the middle, I want to keep it kind of very short and simple and you can use, um, you can caption it if you want to add a little bit more in the text. And then when you end your story, you can be like, hey, you know, thank you so much for joining me. I hope that was helpful. And this is where you can kind of create a call to action to create dialogue. So you could, um, you know, be like, DM me if, you know, if you have any more questions or you can have a poll saying, hey, what, vote yes or no if this was helpful. The more people start interacting on your stories, the more Instagram will show them your stories. So if they see that people are interacting you, watching you, they're going to know that that person is interested in your content and their, their algorithm is going to bump it up more to them. I was wondering what was happening with that when I watched some of this stuff. So we have about, <laughs> we have about three minutes left. So just bear, touch on this a little bit and then we're going to talk about engagement. So we'll just run through this though quickly. Sounds good. So with Instagram and Facebook, one of the biggest things and one of the biggest things I want you to do, you do is give a, people a reason to DM you, right? Or give people a reason to message you. Because when you're on a story, you're speaking to, you know, a good amount of people and people know that. But once you start getting people into your Instagram messages or Facebook messages, that's when you can really connect more on a personal level and kind of build that rapport with them and, you know, Talk, chat about their business, get to know them. If they have a problem that you can help them solve, um, do that. And then also Instagram and Facebook as well have a voice note feature. So sometimes I use that to really connect with someone and it has replaced a sales call for me um, before. So I highly recommend using that as well. Thank you for that. And then do you ever post the same story on Facebook and Instagram or do you have any feedback for that? I do. Um, on our Instagram, I will post it on Instagram primarily first, and then I'll click a button to add it to Facebook. And then it goes there because I do have kind of a different audience. Some people prefer Instagram. Some people prefer Facebook. Perfect. Thank you for that feedback. And then um, just last but not least, any engagement tips on um, Instagram and Facebook? Yes. So engagement on Instagram and Facebook. So if you want people to engage with you, you have to go out and engage with them. So if I would, just how you would get business cards and you would search them up on LinkedIn, on LinkedIn, search them up on Instagram and Facebook as well. Get connected with them. When you know you have like a good list of people, of leads who you could potentially work with, get them on your radar. Start liking their pictures. Start commenting. That's going to make them have a, a notification pop up and they're going to be like, oh, hey, who's this person about? They're going to go on your profile. They're going to see your very clear bio. They're going to be like, okay, I might need help with this. And they'll connect back with you. Perfect. And I know um, we're, we're wrapping up. We're at the end here. Do you have any last, any lasting tip you want to leave the audience with just overall arching, like the a thing that really changed your life when you figured it out about uh, Instagram and <clears throat> Facebook that you can share with everybody? A greatest tip, 
Yes. So it's going to be simple, but it's going to be very, very uh, powerful. So I did, I had my business for probably about two years before I ever mentioned it on Instagram. And once I started mentioning it, I had just an influx of leads coming through and it started as a personal profile. And then I eventually went into more business, but it, I just, I was nervous to talk about what I do. I was nervous to get on camera, but as soon as I did it, I was like, wow, why did I not do it sooner? Because you never know who's following you. Even your personal friends. I had personal friends reach out to me and be like, I never knew that you did this. I, my, you know, my husband needs a website or this person needs a website and they connected with me. So my business started growing um, on a much quicker scale once I started talking about it. So I know, um, if you're not familiar with it, it could be very, very nerve wracking to do, but my biggest recommendation is start it try it for at least like three months and you know i'm sure you're going to see it pick up but just try it and just do it <laughs> and practice makes perfect i always say that so the more you the more you do it the better you're going to get at it and the more bang for your buck you're going to get mm -hmm, out of that mm -hmm. so i just think you just need to do it i've seen several people that are starting off and i try to be a supporter of really everybody i can and when they post videos and they're like, you know, this is my first or my second, I'm still not comfortable with it. I'm always like cheering them on saying, just keep, it's about consistency. And that's yeah. really with a lot of things that we do in our life. We want to show up when we're doing it because then people know what to expect. And mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's more authentic in that case too. So Maria, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate that. And thank you for, I know you had something to do today and you extended it. So thank you for doing that. I'm going to, I'm going to bring Deborah back on and Deborah and I are going to wrap up the call together. And I'm just want to um, say, Deborah, there is a lot of stuff that you value you brought to the table today. And I didn't ask you for one last impression, lasting um, kind of tool or the best thing that you can share with everybody today that maybe changed your life when you were going through and social, using social media, particularly LinkedIn, uh, and, um, and in your career path of using it for branding or for whatever? Yes. Okay. So such a big question. I'd love to talk about all day, but I would say a couple things that have really helped is um, really a, a couple things, really intentionally networking with people and making sure that you're, you know, accepting any connection requests that seem remotely legitimate, like, you know, not creepy ones or people that are obviously trying to sell you something that you don't need, but, you know, connection requests, opening yourself up to that has been huge. Um, because as Valerie had mentioned, you know, the more connections you have, the more second connections you have. And so from a business standpoint, I get a ton of my leads through LinkedIn just because I show up higher in, in searches because I have so many connections and because my, my um, profile is optimized. I mean, I get probably, you know, I wouldn't, I don't know about percentage, but a, a ton of our business comes from LinkedIn. So really open yourself up to connections um, and then taking that conversation offline, really asking people like, hey, do you want to have a virtual coffee? Do you want to do this? Making a human connection with your connections is really helpful too. And then I will say also, when I made the switch to get a professional headshot, and I'm not saying everyone has to pay someone for a headshot, but when I really like elevated my headshot from, you know, just a picture to something that I really put a lot of thought into for LinkedIn, I have literally gotten new clients who reached out to me and said, I saw your picture and I knew you were the right person. So I have ROI tied to really having a <laughs> intention. So I know it seems crazy. And when I did it, it seemed insane because I'm like, this is a lot of money for a picture of myself. You know, is this necessary? But if you're building, if you guys have business, you know, if it's for business development and you're online, you know, this is the only way my clients usually see me. Most people don't actually see me. So it's a really big part of your professional brand. Thank you for that, Deborah. I appreciate it. We have one last question from Tanya. I don't see any other questions in the queue and we've answered 48 questions during the show today. So kudos. Our last one is, should we have a separate Facebook and Instagram, personal versus professional? I feel like we've covered that. Maybe Tanya uh, wasn't on during that piece of it, but can you one more time? Cause this is probably the third time this has come up. Can you shed some light on? Yeah, so I think, um definitely uh, Maria's area of expertise, but yes, a separate um, Facebook and Instagram for personal versus professional is helpful. And then, you know, if you're going to have a personal Facebook, just make sure you're shutting down the privacy settings so people can't see anything. And I'm a little bit weird about Facebook. I live on LinkedIn, so I don't do much on Facebook. Um, and my clients tend to be high level executives and my world doesn't usually look like that. So I don't post a ton on Facebook. Um, 
but I would say, you know, just make sure anything you're posting, whether it's about business or about home, that, that you don't mind the world seeing it because they may, whether you have privacy settings closed down or not. So just keep that in mind and do it with intention. I know Maria had mentioned on her Instagram, it started as a personal account that she really started using for lead generation and about her business and mixing the two is great. As long as your personal, um, your personal stuff that you're posting is really still on brand and, and helps show you as a person, but isn't giving too much information. And Maria does a really great job of that. So if you're curious, take a look at her Instagram account and kind of look at and her LinkedIn or her um, uh, Facebook and kind of look at how she marries both. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Thank you for being here on the show. I want to thank Valerie and Maria for being on. I also want to thank the audience, guys that have been following this, and I see the, the thank yous in the um, chat box. I really appreciate you guys following these shows. I'm, I'm so grateful to hear that you guys are benefiting from it. And I, uh, I'm trying to do a call to action at the end of each of these shows, and I have two calls to action. I would ask you guys to connect with our panelists and me if you haven't already on LinkedIn. You have our contact information here. We'd love to be a resource for you. So please do connect with us. The second thing I'd like you to do is I would really appreciate if when we're posting some of these up upcoming shows, if you guys could comment on it. Also, if you have a moment and these are very beneficial, please write a recommendation for me on my profile about these uh, shows and how they're benefiting you and your career and your life uh, during this pandemic. I would really appreciate that as well. So, um, and I love the emails. I love that you guys send me, I read them all. I, I try to respond to every one of them. So just thank you guys very much for being part of this. Thanks to my Meeting Sites Pro team and specifically this one, Alyssa Bunting for all the back work that she's done to help put this on and make it successful. I just really do uh, appreciate it. So that being said, I'm gonna be saying bye for now and I'm wishing you guys well and stay healthy and have a fantastic rest of the week. We look forward to uh, seeing you at a, at a future event. Thank you.